I'm jacked up. Making stuff. I'm jacked up. So much. Welcome to the Meadows and Makers podcast, the home on the MSP Waves. So thank you for joining me today on MSP Waves, and I got some cool, I got a guest uh, lined up today, I got a couple of guests uh, possibly, and um, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, talk a little bit about and keep the conversation going about how you can live more self-sufficiently and more self-sustainably t- today in this age using our modern technology and come with me now on a journey through time and space to the realm of creativity if you if you will so today i got a cool guest that's he's uh yeah, we talked a little bit before the show, and he he is in some of the circles, some of the other circles that I, that I'm in, and I wanted to get him on to have a chat and learn more about him. Uh, it's a dynamic green TK, and uh, and is really interesting character. We chatted a little bit before the show, and we're gonna get to know him a little better today. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about how. Uh, in, in some resources that I'm going through for solar power and one of the, in one of the really good resources, if you're going to look into doing your own DIY systems and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up the show a little bit by continuing on with aquaponics and some of the aquaponics stuff that I've been learning recently. And so it'll be a little bit fluid today. And so I thank you guys for coming to hang out uh, and joining me this morning on this uh, wonderful Saturday. And without further ado, let me let me bring on Dynamic Green TK here. And there's one of his one of his more recent posts, and uh, we'll we'll get to know him. Hey, Dynamic Green, how's it going, man? Hey, 
Hey, Dynamic, can you hear me? Let's see. Yeah, here I am. There you are. There you are. So, hey, Dynamic Green TK, if you wanted to, um, uh, how are you this morning for, for, for stuff? <laughs> I've got my juice in and uh, no, I'm pretty good. Pretty good. Slept pretty good. And yeah, here I am. Awesome, sir. Well, um, yeah, for for the audience that uh, um, and uh, for for everybody out there, if you want to maybe uh, let us know a little bit about yourself and uh, and how how you got started, how you got started in Steam it, and uh, and Rondon asks, uh, what does the TK stand for? <laughs> Well, that's my name. My name is uh, Taylor Cars. It uh, starts with my, just my initials. And I got started on Steam It because of a uh, show called The Outer Light. They lost their Steam It password. And for months, probably, probably like six weeks or so, he just started the show off complaining about his Steam It password. And so I finally looked into it. I was like, oh, wow, this is only a dollar a coin. And look further into it and people were making money and it's controversial to some people, but they were mining the reward pool. And so I, uh -huh. I actually used that to show my landlord who was looking into buying miners and had a diverse, like a crazy, he probably owned all the cryptos that was out. He was going crypto crazy. So I used that to show him like, Hey man, like you don't need to buy a miner. We don't need to spend all this money on power. We can, you know, hopefully you steam it as a way to, uh, you know, mine crypto and, you know, from there have a sustainable way to like raise my kids at home or have supplemental income to my union job, which is on call. And I used to make a really good living on it, but nowadays it's, uh, they, the, the gigs are smaller and they inundated our union hall with a bunch of new people who, don't know the contracts and are willing to work for less. And it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of been a frustrating experience. So I was hoping steam, it could supplement my union income and allow me to stay at home with my kids. And that's kind of the whole premise for me on steam. It. Okay. Okay. Now, um, now you said your background or what you do for a living is, is, uh, you work as a, a stagehand, right? yeah yeah that's been uh it's kind of allowed you know it's kind of allowed me to be a gypsy in a way or a, what i call a migrant farmer you know because yeah I, i'm on call and it, it's kind of it, i'm like a babylonian farmer and i until my my buddy just passed away in northern california but i would go to northern mm -hmm. california when times were slow in vegas and and grow weed and it was an amazing ah. so so i would be in vegas on call doing union shows before i had kids for a long period of time and just make enough money to pay my bills save up enough to go to music festivals or you know just travel around or i mean i didn't do much traveling but you know just i was just living a very casual life of just you know doing shows and and eventually going to Northern California for about 10 years off and on during the summers. And so, yeah, I just kind of like a migrant farmer gypsy type. And uh, that's kind of where I'm at now is my, my buddy up north. Just so I, I, I kind of lost that Northern California get away from Vegas aspect. So now I'm now I'm looking at changing my whole aspect of life. So, yeah, currently I'm a union guy. I spent the last three years staying at home with my kids as I lost my job. Uh, yeah. And so, so now I'm trying to actually re-educate myself into a holistic nutritionalist path. So that's kind of my next uh, move. I'm trying to steer away from from this soul-sucking entertainment business and oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> and uh, become a more of a holistic nutritionalist because that's that's what's turning that's what turns me on. You know, for a long period of time, I would casually tell people just to take probiotics or to eat healthier food and it would always work for a lot of people especially people i know with crohn's and so now it's things have kind of evolved uh to the point to where probiotics and 
healthy food isn't necessarily helping people. So now I, so now you have to take extra measures on top of that. So now I want to become more educated in how to properly help my friends and family from, you know, people that are willing to listen to improve their health. Oh man, that is kind of a difficult, it's, it's kind of a difficult thing. I don't know. I think a lot of people are more conscious about you know, some of the foods and, and things, things now, but, uh, but, you know, I, I, I got really deep into that as well, into the whole detox and, and things like that. And, and, and going down that road and definitely people, you know, when, when you tell them to, uh, one of the first steps that I tell a lot of people is to get like a really good water filter because, you know, you got to, you can't be ingesting all this fluoride in the water supply a lot of times and, and you get like kind of a blank stare, but I actually <laughs> was able to talk a few people, um, and actually kind of listen and, uh, and actually bought like a really good water filter and started doing that. Um, and, and, you know, getting non GMO or locally grown produce, I think is so important now. Um, and I do think it has a lot of effect on people with the, the intestinal diseases because there's a, there's a glyphosate component in some of these GMO foods, which, I mean, the glyphosate is about, you know, d destroying your, your intestinal linings. And so, um, I think it's vitally important. And, uh, so, uh, so are you, did you, did you invest in like some equipment or anything? It, um, uh, where do you get your, your knowledge source from, from a lot of this stuff? So, well, okay. So yeah, first, first off, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a Google, I'm a Google guy for sure. And I'm not that proud of it anymore, but yeah, since 2000, when I started helping my friend up in Northern California back in 2007, his garden was ran a certain way. And this, just, you know, that's a whole nother, it, it, it was easy to grow. And the water supply started, they started putting chloridamide in the water. So hmm. before we would take the, the tap water and let it just the chlorine evaporate. Well, something happened around 2008, 2009 to the water supply in Northern California to where we couldn't let the chloridamide evaporate. So then I started looking into it or the chloridamide, you know, I looked into it. I was like, Oh wow. They're putting chlorine minerals into the water now. Yeah. So, so once they started doing that, that was, uh, I started going way down a rabbit hole. I, I found compost teas. I found Elaine Ingram and that was back in 2009 before it was really trendy. Uh, to do because it's real trendy now compost teas and knowing about the minerals and the chlorine so I had to find a lot of this information from like YouTube and Google back you know 11 years ago and so that's kind of where the rabbit hole started for me but yeah as far as equipment goes I mean just it's tough man you need RO systems and that it's like a waste of water in a way and so we have tall boys out back uh they don't filter the fluoride, but they do filter a lot of the other stuff like the bacteria contaminants and the, the chloridamides and the chlorine. Okay. You still there? I lost you a yeah. little bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're, you're filtering, you're filtering your water and, and using that in, and I, I see one of your, Instagram posts here you got a bunch of buckets out and uh so are you using are you about to do like um and starting to grow in in all these in the on these pots I know so you're out in Las Vegas so your so soil, that, yeah, your soil's not great out there so you guys got to grow in a lot of containers well actually we spent the last three years uh we we had a very ambitious plan unfortunately the only place we could grow was on the north side of the house uh-huh and the south side of the house is where just the way the house is, you know, the doggy door and all the, the dog poops on the south side of the house. It's just not ideal yeah. place to grow our food. So we were growing on the north side of the house and 
we actually spent three years going down a, a quote unquote no till kind of mortgage sport experience. We just again Google farming and grabbing information and being on Instagram and and listening to other people. We didn't really have a we went too big too fast, but we spent like three years building up our soil. Like we took all this clay in the backyard and mixed it with compost and uh, bought like a crap load of worms over the years and beneficial bugs from evergreen organic supply in Oregon. We did a lot of, a lot of stuff with the soil back here, but my landlord's selling the house. So he uh, had it. Yeah. What happened is that we bought too much dirt and we, we have like, <laughs> We have like a foot or more of dirt over this like 50 foot by 20 foot area. And so pretty much I have to move too, but we have to get rid of the dirt. They're like the real estate companies, like, you know, this is too much dirt. So huh. <laughs> I'm going to use all of my landlord's old uh, buckets. He, cause he was growing cannabis uh-huh. for 30 years before I moved in and he had all these old plastic buckets. Uh-huh. So I'm taking all those old plastic buckets, filling them up okay. with dirt. And I, and as my health is improving, I'm not that much into cannabis anymore. Like I, I appreciate it, but going down the whole rabbit hole from like going to Northern California and being taught by an old school Grateful Dead dude that was been <laughs> in business for like 50 years and like hearing all his gripes and then watching everything he griped about being 100% true. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So it's like, you know, going down that whole cannabis route because cannabis did a lot of great things for my health, but okay, but it's like it was more of like a band aid, really, to tell you. That now that I've like detoxed and I'm going down this whole route, like I'm, I'm really not seeing cannabis as for me right now as that beneficial because I, I'm looking at food. So I'm looking at this dirt in the backyard instead of like growing cannabis, which I still probably will. Like I'll probably. I enjoy it. I, I love growing cannabis. That's actually the aspect that I find the most medicinal is just growing it. You know, there's a special kind of, yeah. there's a special kind of, I don't know what it is about the cannabis plant, but there's a special kind of magic to it. And it's, a, huh. it's very, uh, I don't know. I just had some really magical experiences with those plants, especially in Northern California, but, yeah. but either way, I'm more interested in, in like growing food. I want to grow my kale. I want to, at the grocery stores, you can find all the organic food you want, but they're going to be spraying it with some weird mineral chemical in the water to preserve the food as it's being sprayed. Or, you know, the farmer's market, you know, if you go to the farmer's market, at least here in Vegas, you're not going to find that much legitimate farmers. And the legitimate farmers don't go to the farmer's markets anymore. You know, so it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a stressful situation trying to eat healthy, trying to be this and that because it's real hard you know so i'm at the point where i just want to grow my own food i want to i want to do everything right i want to take everything i did wrong and learn from it really yeah yeah amen to that man and and really that's all it takes is is getting out there and and making mistakes like i've done so many things that i've totally freaking failed at and with aquaponics was a is a big one like i you know i started off with uh, one of those IBC totes and flipped the top over and, and did the whole, all the YouTube videos that you see about those. And, and that one completely failed on me and um, started all over and, and got back into it now and learned a lot more. Still got a lot of stuff that I can tweak here and there, but uh, learned so much from that experience and, and getting out there and doing it. But for the longest time, you know, a lot, of what, a lot of what held me back was the fear of failure, but you know, a lot, of, you just got to go for it and try. And once you try, you learn so much. Yeah. You know, there's this guy, John Kohler, uh, growing your greens.com. I'm sure. Oh man. I love that guy. <laughs> oh, me too. But you know, when I was, when I first, cause he's, he's from Sonoma, right. And then, yeah. uh, and he moved to Vegas. So there's a lot of synchronicity, like, with that dude and I, I never met him. I've, I just bought juicers from his company uh-huh. and uh, discounted juicers.com. The dude's amazing. But if, if I could go back in time, I would tell myself like, Hey man, cause he, he's a lot calmer now, but like 10, 12 years ago, watching his gardening videos, he yeah. was all over the place and very sexual. <laughs> you know, he was just like, <laughs> I'm like, John, dude, like 
I get it. You're healthy. And, you know, but if I can go back in time, because the one message he always kind of pushed was having worms, you know, and just, you know, so if I can go back in time, I would just start off with the worm farm. You know, if I could just, if I could just focus in on farming worms and using that, like, really, that's what I would have done, man. If I, I wish I could have just, you know, things would have gone a lot better for me if I would have just focused in on worms, you know? Oh yeah. And the, and just the soil fertility in, in general. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's, that's where the, the microbes and everything in the soil, we were talking to, you were talking to me about that earlier. Like, um, you, you were talking to me about how a lot of the plant health, you know, is supported by the microbes that exist in the soil. If you want, if you want to talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, dude, it's, I'm all about the microbes. I've, I, I've just seen that in, 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 uh, experience just, so what it was, my buddy in Northern California, he, he was using organic fertilizers, you know, it was like, and he made a big deal. It had to be OMRI approved and, you know, there's this whole thing, but I was seeing some negative aspects to that. And it wasn't until you know, the, we discovered that chlorine was killing off the microbes and I started using compost teas using, uh. yeah. So I started seeing that in action and, and, you know, like I was talking about earlier, casually significantly improving people's lives with probiotics, just that alone in Las Vegas, you know, I'm in Las Vegas, so it's not like there's a dairy farm and it's a very mechanical Babylonian kind of town where people like go to Seven Eleven and get like a probiotic drink and think that's what they need, you know, and it's, yeah. it's an interesting thing, you know, so, you know, I, I've been seeing probiotics in general work wonders, you know, so that's kind of, I, I saved, I, I saved us like probably a lot of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars up North wow. because of, because of compost teas alone, you know, like looking at a whole backyard with the hundred plants and they're not budding and the leaves and you know, they're, they're dying and you're like, Oh shit. And then a simple yeah. compost tea, all of a sudden we have twice as much shields. In wow. the so, it, you know, so yeah, I, I kind of, it's all about the microbes, but you know, what also helped is that what I did is I, it just so happened just like five miles down the road at the time. And, they still are one. I think there's another worm farm in America, but at the time they were the only OMRI approved vermicompost place in the entire country in uh, Sonoma Valley Worm Farm. Uh -huh. So I, I did have that benefit and they were much wow. better back then. They're not as good now for some reason. And I think it's just because the area has, has a lot of anaerobic bad stuff going on in the area of Sonoma, unfortunately. A lot of pathogens. Uh -huh. Oh, because of uh, a lot of the pot farmers and stuff and the way that well, they the, do their practices. I, I think it's just the, they use, so the way they do it is uh, dairy farms. They use uh, organic dairy manure. They compost that and then they put worms into it and compost it. But they have a high demand and more, they just, I think they're producing more than they can and the environment from the fires oh. and a lot more blights in the area. I, for whatever reason, because other people like build a soil in Colorado yeah. for a second for a second there, they were having the compost shipped to their place. And they were telling me that they stopped doing that because it was a virtually dead product. Like the product was, there's no microbes in it anymore. Like it was wow. all anaerobic. Oh man. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So there was some, I don't know what it is, man. I don't use it consistently enough. I don't live in the area and I don't have a microscope. So I, I, I can't, <laughs> I, I just, I just, you know, I, I see my buddy applying it. And so I actually told him on before my, you know, the last crop that he grew before he passed away, I, uh, he build a soil. I mean, I build a soil was amazing. I called them up and, you know, I was talking to him about the Sonoma Valley worm farm again. I'm like, dude, the, I, my buddy, I'm sure he's having problems with it. And they're like, yo, you know, tell him to stop using that product. You know, the, the humic acids alone, because he was spraying it. He was spraying the compost tea on his plants. And okay. he was like, you can't spray compost tea on your plants because of the humic acids. The uh... humic acids will clog up the stigmatas. 
and that product that he's using is dead and has mostly anaerobic. So he stopped using that, started using build a soils uh, amino or the fish product they have. They have some, they have some fish products and oh. it turned out great. Turned out great, and he started using fulvic acid, which is a humic acid, but it's like a micronized version of humic acid. So he started using the fulvex, which is cool to spray on your plants, and everything turned out much better. Wow, yeah. I uh, With aquaponics, and one of the, the benefits of it is you get these solids uh, that you're filtering out of the system, and... Um, and when you said the some some of the fish stuff, I, I'm assuming it's it's something like that is the solids from the fish waste from aquaculture, um, aquaponics. But uh, I've used that on on some of my plants and just seen an, an explosion of growth. Like um, I I've been growing a pineapple for for quite some quite some years and and nothing started to kick it into high gear uh like the the solids from the fish waste and uh it does uh it does amazing things and one of the things that um that you're talking about there um I, i'm wondering if you have you ever heard of something called terra preta not i mean is that a is that a company or is that a style of uh fish harvest uh, no, it's just, um, it's just a, a soil that they discovered in the, the Amazon. They discovered that there's this soil that just regenerates itself. Uh, they call it terra, they call it terra preta, but it's a soil that's mixed with activated, activated carbon, which is just charcoal, which is just, you know, from your fire or whatever, you smother it from oxygen and you have all this charcoal and it gives it like a huge surface area for the microbes to thrive in. And so you mix that, they've mixed that in the soil and, and there's this area in the Amazon where all the soil just regenerates. It's full of microbes and living organisms. It's like the soil is alive pretty much. And it just, Oh yeah, yeah man. That's, that sounds like the whole concept behind uh, biochar. I mean, biochar is exactly. So, I, but I, I wouldn't be like, I personally wouldn't, like go out looking for that soil just because knowing that it's like from the Amazon and you know, uh, it, yeah. you know, just a big, if, if we're going to, we're all set up for a food shortage, right? They set up the whole entire, at least North America. I'm not quite sure how Europe's set up, but I would imagine it's set up the same way. But I mean, if there's going to be a food shortage just because of our dependency on food, that's like, you know, that, that, that is like growing in our country, right? Like we have oranges growing in America, but we're getting them from Mexico. Yeah. You know? So it's like <laughs> is it, it, that, that alone, other than the fact that, you know, like coffee production, for example, is like destroying native habitats because of the demand for it. You know, it's, it's just something I wouldn't be that for getting it from the amazon but yeah i think you could mimic the same and, and people are with biochar oh you know? yeah that that's what i'm talking about not 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 getting it from there but the, learning how to to create that soil but yes that is how that's how you create it is is, is via the the biochar so yeah it's um you know if you have i think the combination of the the compost tea like you're saying in the uh um Hey, Kodaks, thanks for, thanks for joining us. Sorry, you got to go, man. Uh, but thank you for being here. And, um, but I think the combination of the biochar plus the compost tea and all that stuff is, a uh, a way to really, um, boost the soil fertility and to create something like the, the Terra Preta, uh, something that I'm, I'm looking to experiment with. Yeah, that dynamic crypto as most people here listening or whatever would would know him as my landlord troy he uh we started collecting wood <laughs> we have like big old wood piles and we with the aims of doing biochar and he actually i i, I say he he kind of ruined our barbecue because he started making that that's also what's in the soil over the years we would cook up a bunch of wood <laughs> and throw it in the soil that was something I mean, that is a huge, huge thing. I mean, a lot of, a lot of my experiences, like with trying to do a system where you don't apply fertilizers or use inputs, one thing that is lacking, 
at least here in Vegas with our alkaline clay soils is uh, is carbon material and biochar really provides a, a a good part of the phosphorus cycle the carbon cycle you know where where your plants need that for like creating fruits and stuff for your fruit bearing trees yeah yeah I know uh, if do you follow Jeff Lawton at all? He he's like one of my heroes, man. Like he's doing the whole greening the desert thing out in out in Jordan, and has like the way that they set up their permaculture practice. Like they they have biochar. Um, they con they are constantly creating biochar, and they're just trying to save all the water that they can on the property, and and just uh. uh you know, conserve all that water and they're transforming the desert and people around him are picking up the, the techniques and everything. And they do like, uh, they do these like circles where they grow and they grow their trees around the circles and the, the, the inner circle is their compost. And so they, uh, they put all the compost and everything in there and it builds the fertility around because the plants are, are pulling the nutrients from that center circle. And, um, and it's, yeah, fascinating that you can just rebuild the soil fertility in an area that's totally been depleted. Yeah. You, yeah, you can see that with a lot of different, uh, I, I don't know who that dude is. Uh, but I'm sure, uh, I mean, I might, you know, he might, if I watch him, like, oh, yeah, I, I think I've heard of him before. But, no, I've, I, I've, there's people doing that. That's a common way to do stuff. There's, a, like, a French, there's a French way of farming where you create rows and then you put compost, you layer the rows in front of the rows and you put compost down. You know, you, you, you do it a specific way where you put, like, green material, like, food scraps and grass clippings and stuff on one, you know, one layer, then you put, mulched wood or there's a certain way you put like leaves and like uh, chipped material on top of it there's a certain way to build compost piles and so yeah there is a certain way you do that and then like at the end of the year you just move the pile over on top of that compost pile and then you just keep doing that year in and year out and, uh, so yeah there's there's different styles of doing that and um yeah that's key man you really want to make sure that a lot of food and debris from that plant stays in that area for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so your, your background, um, how did you get, how'd you get into being, becoming a stagehand? Uh, I got, I got a buddy of mine that does that as well. He, he travels all over the world doing, doing shows and setting them up and, and getting those stages ready and doing all that stuff. How, how did you get involved in that in the beginning? Well, I was, uh, man, that's, that's a good question. It's, <laughs> it was, it was, a, you know, ultimately it was a very convenient thing that happened. And, uh, I, I was a loss of it. I, both my, uh, both my parents passed away when I was 11, nothing to be sorry about. I think it's a blessing. You know, it was a oh, very man. freeing experience it was a very freeing experience that I think that has allowed me to go down my radical paths that I've been down. Yeah. But, um, but, uh, so my parents passed away when I was 11 and I lived with like three or four different families. I was a typical like Cinderella orphan, you know, it was like a whole sad story, whatever. And so one of my parents friends, by the time I turned 18 was like, okay, you, uh, you need to do this. And so I did it and it, yeah. And I'm still doing it. And I don't know why probably cause you know, it's just, it's, it's a trap. It's a full huh. on, it's a full on trap because I got into it when the time was good. Okay. I, I was, a, I was like an 18 year old kid and there was a lot of work. I'm able bodied. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was really easy for, and it's on call so I could pick and choose my work and, you know, I'm the yeah. kind of person, I'm the kind of person that's not lazy. I can work. I, I, you know, whatever, you know, I can do all that stuff. So something just fell in my house. I'm like, whoa, but, uh, <laughs> you know, but yeah, I, uh, so yeah, it was just real good. And uh -huh. all since the risk between the recession and this big push for, uh, 
I don't even want to get too much into like the politics of it, but yeah, since the recession and this big push to lower wages and uh, just, I, I, don't, I don't know. It's just a kind of a big deal for me. So it's hard for me to even talk about, but yes, yeah, it's, it's just been a trap, man. And like, uh, I want to get out of it. So yeah, that's why yeah. I'm doing it. It was, it was just convenient. It was just a convenient way to make money, a convenient, convenient way to make money. It was awesome. We work off contracts. We get a fair day's wage. Everything about it was awesome. Yeah. But it's a little, different. it's just a little different now. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Yeah. My, my buddy works for it. He's in some kind of union for it as well. And, um, yeah, he got, he got involved in some way of doing like these, these bigger shows, big, bigger company or something like that. But, um, uh, but, uh, yeah, he travels all over the world doing that kind of stuff. And it, and it's like, um, I, it seems like if, if you, you got, you might have to travel a lot to be able to get, um, to do well, it. Uh, it, you know what? I'm in Las Vegas, so I've been spoiled. Yeah, I'm one of the that's spoiled. True. So, so I was spoiled. Like I could pick and choose, and and so, like I I mentioned earlier, the gigs are a lot smaller. So, people in most states, parts of the country, they have to travel to do the shows that are just conveniently here in my backyard. I mean, for before I had children, I would ride my bicycle to work to do a you know, a thousand light gig or something crazy, you know, and then just call it a day, you know, like, okay, I'm going to go to California and see some music show now. But, uh, so, <laughs> you know, a lot of people, I mean, so it's so bad now in the entertainment business is that, uh, right now they're hiring people, they're hiring companies that can supply labor, for example, to a show for like 14 bucks an hour. And so these companies find People, especially in Texas, for example, where it's a big state with like two or three big cities. Uh-huh. And so they, they get these people traveling on their own dime and sleeping in their cars or paying for their own hotels and not getting paid to do any of that. No per diem, no nothing. Oh, man. And then they, and they, they don't get paid till they start work. And uh-huh. uh, <laughs> yeah, so they're that's kind of the big thing now is finding people that will do that for 14 an hour when... You know, I'm used to doing that for anywhere for, and I'm, you know, this is why I say I'm spoiled to some people, but yeah, I mean, that's the whole point of the union is that you, you know, fight for your right. You know, we, we fought for these rights over the years and we're just throwing them away now, but, uh, yeah. you know, we get paid 30 to 40 an hour, you know, yeah. we, we get stuff like we get paid two hours after lunch, four hour minimums, it's insurance and pensions, which we don't really have you know we don't really have access to and uh yeah uh, it, i don't know so it i'm used to that you know i'm used to just working whenever doing these huge shows and yeah and it's gone to the point to where the shows aren't that big anymore and the clients are tired of being ripped off by the casinos and the labor companies uh, and uh they pretty much fired all the really good guys to make it to where uh people with no experience can run up the bills on these clients so it's uh oh, wow. so for, for, yeah you're right like now we're all the guys with experience they went on tour like you have to go on tour now or you have to go you have to go work for a production company getting day rates yeah and i'm not i'm not that ready to uh and, or you can like in my case i do lighting so i can buy a lighting board for like five thousand dollars or more okay and and i can freelance you could contract yourself yeah all day long make 500 to 700 dollars a day and i i kind of want to do that but this business is a trap it's not what i want to do i don't want to travel on airplanes i don't want to uh succumb to some corporate thing i mean i just did a show i just did a show all about the artificial intelligence and and they had a fungal some kind of weird fungal thing they had patented that they were using with their ai thing Huh. And I, look, I mean, I appreciate the insider info I'm getting from these shows, and I, you know, it's real cool and interesting. But I would just rather grow my own food and help heal people. Like I don't want to, like work. I, everyone I work with, man, like it's so sad. Like they have crazy diseases. They're losing half their organs. They're dying, and it's because of the environment we're in. I mean, our safety speeches used to include stuff like, okay, the Monaco in this building can give you cancer 20 years from now. You know, like I don't, 
I, wow. I, it's, yeah. It could be good for my business that I'm going to start in a couple of years or probably by the end of the year to like help heal people, to yeah. heal these people. But like, I just, I don't want, I don't know. It's just, I, I it's driving me nuts. I, I can't, I just, I, it's insanity to be in this business for money. If you're just going to die of cancer and lose half your organs and uh, do shows wow. all about it, you know? <laughs> wow, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I used to, um, I used to do materials research and, you know, going through all the, you know, the MSDS sheets, you know, we were working with, um, we we're working with hydrofluoric acid, like pickling steel and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, had to, had to be under hood vents and, and stuff like that. And then, um, um, and, and then working with fiberglass, a lot of that stuff. Um, and yeah, you just, you just start to accumulate all that stuff over time and, and it, it just creeps up on you and yeah oh, dude the carpet the carpet fiber so i i work a lot in either an expo an expo situation where it's concrete and you have monocoat and dust from like the 30s or 40s and 50s falling down on you and propane mm -hmm. fumes everywhere so you have that or you have carpet fuzz oh my goodness in the casinos in these oh, meeting yeah. rooms the carpet fuzz you're breathing in the carpet like you mm. come home, it's carpet fuzz, all of your clothing, you're coughing it up. It's in your, oh yeah, it's, it's just, and then, yeah. And it, so I'm 34. My nickname's Cubby because I've been doing this since I was 18. Uh -huh. So I've been working with guys in their fifties for most of my life. And so I'm climbing up that rung. And so now I'm halfway to 50 and most of the guys I've worked with, they're like, they're, they're not around. You know, wow. they're dropping like flies from their health. So, and the whole time they're making fun of me for eating healthy or, you know, calling me a conspiracy theorist or being like, you know, why are you smoking weed? You need to do cannabis or you need to do pills and alcohol. And so like, it's just funny, like this sick cycle where I'm like watching all those guys dropping like flies and there's a whole new group of them. And they're saying the same thing, like got to drink alcohol and take your pills. And it's like craziest, like craziest yeah. vicious cycle. And here I am just like, I don't know. Seeing, I, I, yeah. Seeing it all and seeing that there's a, there's a different way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm with you, man. And, and like, I, I commend you on, on going down the, the path, like in trying to, trying to be an entrepreneur and, and going that, that route. Like, yeah, I was, I was kind of doing the same, uh, kind of working the corporate nine to five and, and, uh, mine was in, in the, like the building and construction industry for, for a little bit. And, uh, and it just was, uh, you know, it was kind of a soul sucking thing. Um, and, uh, how many people, how many people do you know with miso delioma or a man or a man? Uh, well, I don't, I don't know. I was on the project project management side of, of, of all that, but, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, the guys, some of the guys that I used to work with in, in, um, in, uh, in, in doing the lab work and, and all that kind of stuff, like, you know, we were working with carbon fiber, fiberglass, all that crap all the time. And, um, you know, the, they they all kind of went off to, to do other stuff too. I don't know. It's just, so yeah, that's why I want to make uh, my own food, man. Like that's a big like peanut butter. You know, if you buy organic peanut butter, there's like a crap load of fire retardant in that. So, you know, I got this. Uh, wow. I got this eight hundred. It's eight hundred dollars nowadays. It used to be nine hundred or whatever. But I got this juicer that can process nuts and uh, you know nuts and whatever. So uh -huh. so yeah, that's a big part is buying your own peanuts and, or nuts and making your own nut butters. You know, that's something I want to really get into is like, uh, probably, uh, probably grow your own peanuts. You know, if I, I'm looking at doing that, you know, the, okay. growing your own bananas. Cause like your, the bananas are not cool. You know, that you see at the store, you yeah. really need to like, get like the red banana. And even then it's being shipped from typically another country. So that's treated a lot of the times before it gets through our borders. So like, you know yeah man if you want to get started doing that uh i 
uh, if I would recommend you get on the on the Homesteaders Co-op and talk to Sage Scrub because like especially uh, there's he's kind of built this website and it's kind of becoming more like a barter network as well where people can trade in between each other. So, you know, if somebody's growing some organic peanuts somewhere in the world, you know, you could, you could try to work a trade and say, Hey, you know, I'll, I'll do the, make the peanut butter out of it or something and give you some and then be able to sell it on homesteaders co-op or something like that. Well, yeah, I do. So, you know, I don't want to self incriminate myself, but I don't think this is going to be a big deal or anything, but over the years, Yeah you know, a big way of finding sustainability and consuming cannabis, you know, uh, was to uh-huh. provide it to people over the years, yeah. you know? And so, you know, do in doing that, I never made money, but I always either got to consume cannabis for free or at a significantly reduced price. Right. And that's kind of how I always approached it for like 14, you know, since I was, man, almost, too long i can't even yeah oh man <laughs> almost 20 years i guess uh yeah man but off and on off and on really you know having kids that all kind of stopped and but either way i want to do that with food so you know i'm looking at maybe buying a bunch of coconuts and processing these coconuts into coconut butter for example to better sustain my new path that i want to go down on eating healthy so yeah that's that's one thing I want to do is uh, is find someone other than I mean I found a place in town that ships coconuts from a place in Belize, but it would be way chiller to support like a steaming and buy bulk, yeah. uh, for example, bulk dates and make date syrup. You know, I think I see mm. I see a potential in with this with these machines I have and making date some date products because. It's yeah. an alternative for sugar and dates are amazing. You know, if you don't like dates, I don't know what kind of person you are, but I mean, <laughs> whatever. I don't mean. Yeah, to- eat dates. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just, but either way, uh, I see a lot of potential in making dates and coconut stuff with my juicer. So that's one thing I want to do is yeah. buy those in bulk and support my my new addiction of healthy food. Yeah, well, that's really cool. Yeah, because those those that juicing equipment is not cheap. Like, uh, I looked into it a while back, and I think it's it's fairly expensive, isn't it? Well, yeah. In fact, my land. So, man, I'm doing some. I I, I did some stupid things, man. I I'm expecting a ten thousand dollar tax return, right? And then I also I pulled out my annuity. And I so I'm looking at like I pulled out I was only able to pull out a small percentage. I pulled out like three thousand of my annuity and I used half of it pretty much on a five hundred dollar blender, a vacuum blender, and an eight hundred dollar uh juicer. Okay. Yeah, and it's a slow press juicer. And what I saw the potential of that was I could actually slow press juice and provide that as a product or make all my juice at once and have like seven days because i have a vacuum sealer so i can seal the juice up and you know so i was hoping to like i just saw a lot of potential in having a business like at a farmer's oh man oh yeah man that would be that would be really cool and maybe maybe even doing like microgreens with it or something like that and like uh juicing microgreens or something well that was the, you know, and that was the second part of it. I mean, the, the, the kind of serious aspect of it was that, man, I love this man to death. The guy like in Vegas, Vegas is such an impossible town. And I, I was at a point with my career where I was being told by the, my family, I guess I would call them, you know, pseudo family. Yeah. And they were telling me to, dump my girlfriend because she was in the business and I, I loved her and she's like you know like you need to dump her we're going to make you a foreman at work and you need to buy a house and this is before the crash this is like back in 2006 2007 yeah and and i was like the problem the reason i brought up my parents passing away when i was 11 is because yeah uh, a snapshot of my ideals at the time of like you know, don't be ignorant. Everything's all good. And, you know, there's good in people and, you know, doing the right thing, you know, like the concepts of right and wrong were still like solidified in my uh, persona. And so that yeah. kind of got like got ingrained into me. So 
I, so like, and it still is a problem I'm having with ideals. So I was just like, no, that's not right. I'm not going to buy a house that was two hundred thousand dollars just a year ago. That's four hundred thousand now. I'm not going to break. I'm not going to compromise everything I'm about just to have a job making money. So yeah, um, it, I don't know that. that so that's kind of that's kind of where I was at. I don't know what the point was. I lost my train of thought. But uh, what was the question? I'm sorry. Uh. We were just talking about um, uh, <laughs> uh, just the juicing equipment and 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 the uh, the costs of it and and how you're seeing like a business business potential in it and and you're trying to move away from just trying to be sucked into the corporate life. You're you're trying to move into more of a uh, working with the farmers markets in your local area and trying to heal people and stuff. So. So it's yeah. So no, that that's kind of just where I'm at. I don't want to. I just I'm just tired of compromising myself. So yeah, I wanna I wanna just uh, eat healthy food now, man, and 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 encourage others to do the same. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, dude, I totally am am on the same page with. I'm on the same page with you, man. And um, it it it's you know without if we really want to change the world, we have to take that. We have to take that action ourselves, and I, I'm looking at selling my house in, right now and just going full tilt on, you know, getting my homestead started and and living off the land a little bit and trying to get a permaculture farm going, and and really oh, really going for it. Yeah, man, sacrifice is what it's all about, man. It's uh, I kind of was under the pressure you were already doing that. I need to, I guess I need to follow your page a little. Yeah, I'm 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 in the process of of transitioning into that, and I you know I've been building this this trailer so that it's gonna make it uh, easy to well not easy but uh, to make it a little bit easier. It's it's got all the the power set up and and it's got you know everything I, everything I envisioned putting in there in the beginning I've got in there currently. Uh, except for a, a small aquaponics system, so that I can transfer, uh, I can transfer fish from one location to another and seed aquaponics systems with it. So that's the last component I'm working on, and then, you know, I'll be I'll be moving out to my land, looking to sell my house and and uh, and just totally go full tilt on it, and so. Uh, right now I'm, I'm like Airbnb being my house in, in town and, um, and then just trying to work on the stream. So. Yeah, man, the aquaponics thing is like real is so it's real intriguing, man. And there's a lot of things that have stopped me from doing a lot of things like kombucha. I, I've looked too far into it. And for example, and you got to, I've, I ran across a thread where you can feed your kombucha green tea to give it this kind of mineral and vitamin properties or feed it this kind of tea. So I went too far with it, but like, so I guess when I look into aquaponics, everything looks great about it, except for the aspect of like disease and the, uh, just the, just the aspect of, uh, yeah, I, I, I just haven't seen the, the uh, sustainable aspect of it, because it seems like the fishes get diseases, and I'm not sure. Uh, I've just I'm ignorant to that aspect. But when I, whenever I look into it, I don't. I'm not. I'm having a hard time finding a a cool symbiotic way to farm the fish. Yeah, you definitely have to monitor the water quality. It's all about monitoring your water quality and trimming it, and you just have to be on it all the time. And so. Uh, it all depends on, on, on water quality and how you're starting, starting off with, you know, the water that you're using. And so, you know, you want to try to stay away. You want to try to collect rainwater and, and start with that, or you want to filter the water really well so that you're not, you know, beginning with all the contaminants in the water and stuff like that, that could, that could get into the fish, everything in the system. It's all, uh, you know, it all feeds, into itself so any kind of contamination or anything that you're going to put in the system in the beginning 
it is just gonna uh, uh, stay there. So you really have to worry about your water quality in the beginning and that, and then that will help save you a lot of headache and, and stuff getting the system going. But, uh, but it, it, once you get the processes started with the, 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 the bacteria that help to convert the nitrates, to, uh, nitrites for the plants and get all that started, then the system kind of finds itself in equilibrium and, and it, it starts to take care of itself a lot easier, but you just have to stay on top of water quality and you have to, yeah, you, you always, you gotta be taking samples in your fish tank and, and in your, um, in your sump and, and always checking what your pH levels and, and your alkalinity is and, and different stuff. And then you can add things like, uh, because the plants are, are adding, um, uh, they're adding acid actually into the water over time and yeah um that's how they're processing the carbon dioxide is they're they're actually uh uh releasing a carbonic acid into um into the medium that they're growing in and that's how they release the ions to uptake for the plant and so um and so over time the the water can can become more acidic and that can hurt your fish and so so you have to add um, uh, calcium carbonate to to the water supply to to uh, keep the fish in the alkalinity and the pH adjusted. So uh, it's definitely not you know it's like set it and forget it kind of thing. But uh, you know once you get the system established, then you can kind of walk away from it. I, I started mine in the the form it is now. I started it back in August. And I haven't had to do uh, very much monitoring after I got everything balanced in the beginning. Uh, I haven't had to do much monitoring since I've I've taken I've taken one water supply sample, and I'm about to do another one just to check what the what my levels are at right now. But um, yeah, once you get it going and you get it in, established in the right way, then it can kind of be uh, more automated. But yeah. It is uh it is a little bit um it it is a little bit of work. It's 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 definitely a thinking way of growing. You have to really be on your toes and and understand all the the biological processes and and the water chemistry and and stuff like that, but uh but w- once you get the whole system going, it's it's a very uh symbiotic way of growing and and uh can you can pretty much uh if you get that all set up you could make it a, a very sustainable practice in a very closed loop system so um but it takes have a lot you, of learning uh, have you heard of uh i'm sure you've heard of lactic acid bacteria but have you have you uh explored creating uh, your own lactic acid bacteria from your environment no no uh, so i'll have to look dynamic into- dynamic crypto uh one of the ambitious projects he wanted to do a couple of years ago was he wanted to convert his swimming pool into a pond. Yeah. And he wanted, but really like, so I'm like the organic crunchy hippie dude, you know, that's like, Oh no, we, we gotta, we, we gotta find a chill sustainable way and we gotta do it right. And he'd be like, okay, okay, okay. But so the reason he wanted the pool to be into a pond was that he wanted to fish. You know, he wanted to sit out back here and, and fish for base or, you know, bass and other stuff. And uh-huh. so, so going down that rabbit hole, we, we eventually settled on a, like a way to build a pond with like, you know, put a greenhouse cover over it, get like a solar powered pump to pump the water and have the fish waste go into the plants in the greenhouse and have the chickens on top of the pond pooping and feeding the fish and you yeah. know we, we just but but you know we went too far <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> like there is no way we were going to afford that or have the time or resources to build it you know so it's like but that's one thing we were looking at and so we started doing that and he if you go far into my instagram post if i mean my instagram's connected to my, to my steam and there's yeah. two i mean it's it's hard i have thousands and thousands of posts but 
Yeah. If you go far you know, like two years ago, you'll start seeing all this crazy stuff we were doing. So Dynamic Crypto bought all these pond plants. Uh -huh. You know, he, he got all these pond plants and we put it in our five by 10 greenhouse or our, uh, grow tent. And that was madness. That was, that was crazy. And one of the, one of the things that really helped us, I mean, he bought fish too, but the fish didn't really survive that well. And they, they ended up, yeah. ended up getting more fish later on once we started kind of getting the hang of it and they survived. But, um, you know, that's a whole nother story, but one key thing was the lactic acid bacteria was, uh, we would put bubblers in the water and that would help. But yeah. one thing that really helped prevent a lot of the algae buildup and, you know, just bugs from happening in the greenhouse or at least the negative ones, you know, cause what we found is the beneficial bugs like the dragonflies or, you know, just beneficial bugs survived, but uh -huh. not, the, not the, you know, not the mosquitoes or other stuff, but yeah. Well, so Korean natural farming going down that rabbit hole, a big thing is harvesting microbes from your environment. And we would take rice wash and leave it out with the paper towel lid. Uh huh. It would collect the microbes in there, all of them, good and bad. And as soon as this smells sweet, that's when you knew it was inoculated. Hmm. You take that and you put that into <clears throat> uh, one to ten parts of milk. You hmm. want to find this. You want to find organic whole milk, one that's full. You know, you, you don't want two percent. You want whole milk. You want to make sure all the lactic acid, all the lactose, because it's the sugar that the microbes. Okay. That specifically the lactic acid bacteria and beneficial yeast eat. Okay. So what you do is that you put it in milk and there's two ways you can do it. You can do a wild fermentation, which is what Korean natural farming teaches you, where you just put a paper towel over it. Okay. Or you, can, or you can use the airlock and you use the airlock. And if you're going to, if you're going to use it as a way to consume your, your probiotics, you want to use the airlock in my opinion. Okay. Because that, because what happens is that lactic acid bacteria is an anaerobic beneficial bacteria. So right. What what happens is when you cut it off the air supply, you just ensure that it's a uh, lactic acid bacteria that's going to consume the milk. Oh. And, not, and then that becomes a, while, a very beneficial probiotic. Yeah. If you give me a second, I'll look at my steam page and find uh, an example of it or. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah, I'll go find an example of it from Chris Trump's uh, YouTube, but it's it's really cool way. And so what I would do is I would use that lactic acid bacteria and I would put just maybe a shot glass and maybe 20 gallons of water and it would instantly clear up the water. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that, that's uh, that is that is quite interesting. Yeah, I um, the the way I uh, modified uh, my system is that I'm using you, you have to you have to be able to remove the solids from the uh, from the area that your fish are, are staying in otherwise if the solids start to decay then they're they're gonna release carbon dioxide and they're gonna start uh, uh, pretty much uh, suffocating your fish and so that was one of the hard lessons I learned and so uh, so I'll have to, uh, you know, uh, uh, oh, cool. Cool. You posted the, the, how to do the lactic acid thing here, huh? Um, yeah, this Chris Trump guy, man, uh, you know, I, uh, I met the dude and I, I, I admire the guy. He's a, he's a really, as far as sustainable farming and, trying to help people do that and just I, the dude's amazing the dude is a the dude is a great dude to learn from and just a, a stand-up character in this sustainable world we live in awesome yeah he i'm gonna be, check him out yeah so yeah that's that may that may have been one of the problems with uh the system that um that you guys set up is that uh uh yeah if, if you don't have a good way of, of removing the solids from the system through like some kind of like media filter or something like that um 
like well we did well we did that uh we ended up doing it it was a whole it was a whole journey yeah Uh, so (laughs) so when he got the palm plants it was like the middle of winter so that's why we stuck him in the grow tent right and the plan was to put him in the pool well like i was saying earlier we went too big too fast trying to do too many things and and i was just like the migrant farmer trying to like make things make make my sister or my friend and just I'm trying to make this dude's vision happen <laughs> you know oh, okay that. yeah and so and so we were just like we'll we'll just stick him in the pool so we stuck him in the pool and we did it we have a jacuzzi the boy the pool set up it's like a jacuzzi area oh okay yeah a little tiny spa and then if the overflow goes into the pool kind of thing so the pool is empty by the time spring r- rolled around and we put the and he found a way using air stones and and a pvc pipe and gravity basically to you know recirculate the water through the filter medium yeah you know? but we found out quickly that there's chlorine in the pool wall so you have to you know you have to line the pool wall up with some kind of liner or like a rubber kind of thing you know? oh yeah mm-hmm. yeah so we found out pretty quickly like oh so I mean, we hit we hit some pretty significant roadblocks that was a bit discouraging, you know, in all sorts of ways, like financially, ma- mainly, you know, in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, totally understand yeah, that. You're right. We, we started doing that, and it, it was cool, man. It was cool. It was just the chlorine in there. So what we ended up doing was we had what we have left is is these uh, I forget what they're called. There's a name for them. But just uh, we have these palm plants left. They're like bamboo. They're they're a relative of the bamboo family. Okay. And we have I, right now. I have I planted one directly into the ground, and I have one in water still, with a bubbler. Huh. And what I'll do is I'll add the lactic acid bacteria to that. There's no fish in there anymore. Yeah. The fish will survive as long as I'm good about adding the lactic acid bacteria and keeping the water level appropriate. Yeah. Uh, otherwise the algae starts growing and it suffocates everything in the water. But even then, dude, we still, it was weird. Was fish, I mean, I don't know. We, the fish still survive. We would have the water go to like an inch deep with nothing but, you know, algae and then the fish would still survive. I mean, I don't know what, Yeah. I think that, I don't know what it was. They were just resilient. They probably weren't the healthiest of fish and we weren't like harvesting them or anything. They were just fish hanging out, you know? Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, that was a big thing. Wow. So now we still have that, and and uh, as long as I add the lactic acid bacteria, the water like clears up, and there's no fish, but no more algae, and it's really cool. But wow, cool. but it's what it is. It's just a really diverse set of microbes. So like we you see the microbes for pools, right? You go to the pool place, and there's like bacteria things like barley straw and other whatever bacterial stuff, and. Uh, and that that's like one microbe that they found to be like the key microbe to help whatever like em1 this is basically em1 right have you heard of em1 no 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 i'm not sure what that is oh dude em1 is like this specific lactic acid bacteria that this japanese scientist discovered in like the 80s or something Uh and and they found that it's uh you know it just it's like just a really strong microbe that eats grease it eats e coli everything but that's what lactic acid bacteria does in general okay but but yeah this if you look up em1 i can find the link i can look for it real quick but it people use it in restaurants in florida for example and okay. they don't have to clean out their grease traps anymore uh, wow. there's no flies like they'll ha- they'll have flies all outside their building but the flies don't come inside because after they clean their restaurant, they'll just lightly mist EM1 with stuff. And uh, the EM1 wow. just eats all the E. coli wow. in, in the area and it makes it to where there's, the flies don't want to come in because there's, there's no E. coli for them to eat. So, so this is a type of uh, bacteria that does this? Uh, yeah, it's a lactic acid bacteria. And, ah. Uh, apparently there's more than one but so the lab is the same thing but it's like super diverse and way more potent and uh here wow. I'll, I'll look up EM, i'll look up em1 real quick but that's what the lab is it's, it's just these lactic acid bacteria 
This is and the cannabis farmers. This is cannabis farmers are all about it. Cannabis farmers are all about it. Like it, it's like really key. Like it's a microbe that's really key in breaking down uh, stuff in your soil as well. So if you don't have a, if you don't have a properly built compost pile, or you're like cannabis growing and you're loading it with nutrients, yeah, like a lot of a lot of cannabis growers are all about just like and the cannabis plant is a hungry plant. The cannabis plant does want a lot of food. Uh -huh. So if you don't, if you don't build your soil properly, you're going to need to supplement it with nutrients, some kind of so fertilizer. That, yeah. In order to get the yields or quality that you expect from a plant. So, okay. so what happens is that you need those microbes. If you don't have those microbes, it's, the plant's not going to fully uptake stuff and you're going to have soil imbalances. So a common thing nowadays is for people to take this LAB product, at least in the cannabis world, and apply it to their plants like every feeding even you know to break down all the nutrients that they're adding to the soil oh okay very interesting yeah this is the first time i've ever heard about about this kind of stuff but uh having a I, i'm guessing i'm guessing it's just the anaerobic uh, bacteria component that helps break down organic matter um and also can fight E. coli and, and other things. That's that's fascinating. Yeah, that's wild. So, <laughs> Julius, yeah, Julius says, uh, <laughs> uh, vaginas create lactic acid to keep everything healthy. Lactic acid is magic. Nice. There you go. So, if vaginas do it, you know it's good. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is, this is really neat, man. I, the, this is definitely like a tumbling down the rabbit hole on the, on, uh, lactic, uh, lactic acid bacteria. So they are vaginas produce life. They're magic. So it's pretty amazing. So, where did you where did you start to learn about this? Like, uh, is this just part of the um, the the cannabis when you're when you're growing a lot of the cannabis? You started to to discover this. Yeah, you know, and that's and that's one of the reasons I really treasure and love this man that passed away recently. Uh, he uh, he was always known for growing the most. He, he had the he had the really cool sour diesel strain uh, that was just popular all throughout the '90s and early millennia, and so he was just always known for having the, the dankest Northern California buds. You know, it was like four thousand a pound. You know, and so his buds were always amazing. So when I was just like, "Fuck," I mean, "F Vegas." Sorry for cussing there, right? And I was just like, forget Vegas. I don't need this town. I don't want to like compromise all my morals and ideals. Like he was just like, come on up here, buddy, you know, help me out. And he let me go up there Wow. and he really let me just take ownership, you know, and do all the research and go down the rabbit hole and try to improve things as things went downhill. Uh, when his way of growing wasn't working anymore, you know, like there was, the nutrients had less of a shelf life where they started becoming a lot of the companies got bought up by Monsanto that he was using. And so the formulas changed and the water changed. So he allowed me to really, I, I like to consume data. I like to consume information, uh -huh. and especially stuff that I'm interested about. So he allowed me to consume data. He allowed me to process it. And then he allowed me to apply it into real life. And so, you know, that was something that, that that's what led me down this route. It, and, yeah. and throughout the years, it was, I stumbled upon like the, the, just the, the fact that organic fertilizers were not good. I ran across these uh, hippie farmer, migrant farmer types as well in Sebastopol, California. And they were like, Oh, you think this is organic? You know, they just just really harsh on me, like really put me in check, and and <laughs> and so I went even further down the rabbit hole to find 
more sustainable ways to organic farm. And Korean natural farming was a no brainer. You know, it was like sugar and the food you're growing from your backyard, you know, on top of producing a fungally, fungally dominant compost. So, I mean, it was a no brainer. That's what really brought me down. There was getting punked by some full on and, and you know they were like they were like lesbians social justice warrior types out of like you know uh charles schutz peanuts you know country uh-huh. you know like totally just put me in check and and i and you know <laughs> god yeah. bless them for it because i mean i wouldn't have gone that far down the rabbit hole if i didn't get punked you know by these by these people <laughs> yeah wow cool so so you just kind of uh kind of let go and and this guy brought you into his little uh his little community and you started to just really dive deep do some deep diving into the fertility and all that kind of stuff and and uh the my soil microbes and things like that yeah yeah i mean when when it became abundantly clear that organic fertilizer liquids like liquid organic fertilizer was not the answer and it was causing the product not to taste as good and it was causing microbial imbalances and so i mean that was stuff that i discovered and it took my buddy a long time to uh you know because he he relinquished control of his backyard and just went on a full on like he fully like retired basically it seemed like he he just let go for a number of years, let me take ownership. And uh, so I learned all this stuff and he, uh, it took him some years afterwards to apply what I was learning. So I kind of let go and he, he had to play catch up. And by the time he caught up, he, he was like asking for help. And, and, yeah. uh, and I went even further down some more and, and, and invited him to go to Idaho with me and we learned some more. So it's like, it's quite wow. a journey. You know, it's, quite, it's been quite the journey of just like lots of failures, lots of successes. And uh, now I'm at the point of, because Northern California, anyone can be a, a master grower. I mean, it's, it's it, it, in my experience, like I was able to take stuff and apply it and, and have great success. But yeah, uh, in, in Vegas with acid rain and the way the sun is, it's just, it's a lot different. It's a lot different. Huh. And, you know, in my experience. So I, yeah, I don't know, man. It's just, so it's like, I've had a lot of successes, mono, mono, what would you call that? Mono cropping or whatever. Yeah. I, doing I've a mono, of, monoculture crop. Yeah. I've had lots of successes with cannabis, which is in my opinion, one of the hardest plants to grow. And, uh, and then trying to do that here in Vegas. And it's just been like, just a completely different experience. I can grow it indoors just fine, but outdoors, which is what I really want is it's like, it's a, it's a headache. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so with your, with your changes in, in your life that you're going through now, are, do you believe that, um, you're going to stay where you're at or do you, are you wanting to try to, um, uh, relocate yourself? out of get out of vegas oh dude i'm uh so right now my goal is to oh gosh yeah i I don't want to be in vegas right so i'm kind of stuck here though so right right now my goal is to stay around my kids right and get a holistic nutritionist degree and i'm hoping to have a lot more freedom uh, with my cert, it's really a certification process, not a, not a degree by any means. It's accredited in the sense that a national or international pro- program recognizes the certifications. But uh, no, that's kind of my goal is to spend the next six to nine months hold up in a place, getting my de- my certifications, and then hopefully having more flexibility, even if it means moving to like a town outside of Vegas. Cause I have a lot of opportunities here. I can sign in to work and make a hundred to 300 bucks in one day. Yeah. You know, or more, way more. If I, you know, the other day I made like 400 or 500 bucks in one night, you know, wow. but so, yeah, but that's not what I want to do, but it's, a, a, it's an essential tool. You yeah, know? So, for sure. So, so my goal is to kind of like, I, I really want to grow food indoors. Yeah. You know, I want to, I want to have an environment indoors where like I can just casually, cause I want to, 
I discovered stuff with this detox that I feel is necessary. Like I feel like it's necessary to have eight, you know, eight glasses of green juice a day. Yeah. That's expensive. And that's a big part of why I bought the juicer is that this juicer can process dark leafy greens. So wow. I want to be able to, I find that to be more medically beneficial. So I want to be able to have an environment indoors. So take all this soil that we've been working on for three years, it's loaded with earthworms, loaded with compost, everything, you know? Yeah. And, and I want to use that now, put those in buckets and just, if I have to get like a super small studio and just be like living with all these plants and working on my holistic nutritionist degree and uh, okay. casually creating natural farming, like harvesting microbes and harvesting these plants and using them, using my own plants as garden inputs and having a worm farm. And so, yeah, that's kind of what I want to do is process stuff. want to process coconuts, grow my own plants and have worms. And I have all these crazy ambitious goals now that I want to do and have a pretty direct path, but just right now I'm having some issues with uh, my kid's mother and it's just typical sad song, you know, yeah. whatever. So just, just realities that I'm having a hard time dealing with, but it's, uh, it's all looking good. So that's kind of what I want to do is uh, move out of Vegas within the next year, hopefully. Yeah. And at the, at the very least position myself in a good school district okay. or, or be able to afford a nanny to give my kids a better education outside of this stupid Clark County, Las Vegas education system. Oh man. Yeah. I, um, I had one of my cousins, he, he met a girl and he, he moved out to Vegas uh, a long while ago. I mean, they broke, they broke up and everything, but he, he complained so much about the people in Vegas. Um, he was just telling me something like, uh, uh, he had an encounter with somebody out there and where, where he, one of the places he was working and he was like, you, you shouldn't say things that customers don't know or something like that. I don't know. But, but, oh, uh, dude, dude, Vegas is totally like, okay. So <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to, I mean, there's like, I can use all these metaphors, but it's there's man. So Vegas is totally like a keep your mouth shut kind of town. Like, you can commit all the crimes you want here in Vegas, you know, like, but you, you got to keep your mouth shut, you yeah. know, like, you know, so that's kind of the deal, you uh, know, the deal here, the deal here is that it's a full, like it's, it used to be a cheap place to live. And a lot of people are leaving California now because it's cheaper than California and the laws aren't as oppressive. Yeah. And uh, so th there's that, but as long as you keep your mouth shut, you're good. You know, <laughs> I'm serious. Like you can kill yeah, people. What happens? You can totally in, kill people. Yeah. What yeah. happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. But as soon as you start speaking, I mean, and this is like kind of a basic truth in life anyways, it's just Vegas is like a, it's like a, it's a full on macro scale of things. You know, it's totally like corporate America magnified, you know, but yeah, you totally just get away with murder and just keep your mouth shut. And no one cares. But you started speaking up about stuff and people are like, whoa, dude, you're rocking the boat. You're going to ruin my job now. Or like, you're going to, you know, it's like, you're ruining my fucking shit. You know, like, stop it. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. So people kind of self-censor out there. All day, all day. And, and, and it's a sick kind of like cycle too, because, uh, yeah, never mind. But yeah, I don't want to get too far into it. It's, it's a negative but you know what? I will say that Las Vegas is like the world's biggest wishing well, wishing pond. So like, yeah, if you could find a way to keep your nose clean, if you can find a way to network, which I have a hard time doing, you know, like networking in this town for me is difficult because it's a lot of people drink, a lot of people do drugs, a lot of people. And, and it's just kind of a way of life. And it's hard for me to kind of, a mingle in that and so but if you can mingle in that and keep your nose clean and accept people for who they are and and just pretty much dance with the devil if you can dance with the devil and keep your nose clean it's a great town you can manifest anything you want hmm. yeah 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 very interesting so so you grew up there then huh uh, you've spent your life yeah. growing up in vegas 
Oh yeah. Yeah. My, uh, my, my grandfather, he was chief deputy sheriff of Las Vegas. And my dad was actually like head of security at the four Queens at one point downtown and then became head of security over at the Stardust when it first opened. And, oh, wow. Uh, yeah. He bragged about knowing all the mob bosses, knowing all the CEOs in town. And he actually did kill my mother and got, got away with murder. And, it, and and then my mom's dad did the same thing to him and got away with it. And it was all about not fucking talking about it. And it was a whole, yeah, I know Vegas. My experience with Vegas has been quite the extreme one. I'm an, I'm a very extreme person, but no yeah, I've, kidding, seen, man. I've seen the most, I've seen the most extreme sides of Vegas and uh, yeah. So yeah, I grew up here. I'm a total Vegas kid all the way through and through. Wow, man, that's that, that's a crazy story, and yeah, man, like, yeah, I don't know. There, there's like, um, I don't know. I guess, I guess, like, the energies and and stuff, and the way that uh, the culture is, like, I mean, it totally bleeds in on everything, and uh, yeah, it's kind of hard for me to. Uh, you know, I grew up in, in in Alabama here, and it's totally different, totally different culture, um, and from 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 what you're talking about there. Like, um, you know, the big thing around here is is I mean, we live in the Bible Belt, and um, and so everybody, you know, this kind of uh, you know, we just uh, legalized alcohol over a certain percentage and stuff like that, and in in a lot of in a lot of places and and so it's like uh you know growing up uh it, it was it was mostly like people judging you on it on uh whether or not you were drinking or something like that and, and it's pretty well, fun you it, know what it's funny you mention that because i so i did experience a little bit of racism and yeah. and stuff of that nature uh that that like small towns or small communities of people especially when when like a specific type of person it starts gathering in an area you know vegas is the exact opposite of that it's like a yeah you know every, everyone moves to vegas and everyone comes to this town for a specific reason, typically to make money. Yeah. And so, you know, I experienced racism, but on a small scale. And it was only because I was going to a school with a lot of, uh, it was surrounded by low income housing. And I was unaware of it as a kid of what cops meant to people living in low income housing. And I was real proud of my father being a cop and I did experience racism talking about my dad being a cop at school. And yeah, that was a certain kind of reality that still didn't, I didn't really process it until I was probably well into my adult years. But um, aside from that in Vegas, people, um, that is the racist aspect of this town is the cops, the cops historically, is the racial aspect of it but anymore i don't yeah. see that i don't see that anymore but i did grow up with that aspect there's i actually see more black cops and mexican cops in this town than i see white ones but that's just my experience i don't run into the cops all the time <laughs> you know so yeah whatever um but um other than that you were ju you were judged upon your so your so your social standing yeah. you know you weren't you weren't judged on your last name you weren't judged on uh, your skin color. You weren't judged on any of that because it's a very kind of like opportunistic town. Like, what can you do for me? I can do something for you probably, or, you know, so yeah. I didn't grow up with that until I, until I would visit my family in Fallon, Nevada, where I saw the Mormon aspect of it, where I, ironically enough, moved to San Francisco, San Francisco. Uh -huh. I have never experienced so much racism and it's astounding. I never, I never knew that was a 
Yeah. But yeah, Las Vegas isolates you from the concepts of racism unless, you know, you're like a cop or something. But yeah, that's that was a that was a reality I wasn't really grown up with was was uh, racism. It was all about how poor you were or how rich you were. Like in school, I wasn't rich. I was a cannabis smoker who kind of kept to myself. And yeah, everyone else was doing drugs and you know driving fast cars and doctors' sons and stuff. Ah. Uh. Yeah. 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 I saw one of your posts, uh, it made me laugh the other day. Um, and you, you, you were, I guess you were filming a dude that was walking, uh, on the street or whatever. It looked like uh machete or something like that. <laughs> uh, I, I oh, dude, that. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. I love that. Yeah. That was that, that actually, yeah, that made my day. I, I'd worked all night. I was kind of delusional. I don't know. My, it, was, it was my health being better. If I, you know, I'm a morning person. So if I work all night, like I'm up. So like that actually, that actually made my day and allowed me to come home and do some dishes and laundry and stuff But after working all night. But yeah, that was, that was quite the scene, man. I, mean, I you know, you see that a lot in Vegas, just, just rough characters that just, you know, it's just, I don't know, man. It's, you gotta, you gotta be a certain kind of person to live in this town. That person exemplifies that just oh man that was, that was a great yeah i don't know yeah 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 it's like um uh you know fear like the fear and loathing like one of those guys in um <laughs> hunter s thompson's lawyer friend or whatever um but yeah we were talking uh we were dm yeah you dm me a, l- a little while back or you we were hanging out and uh talking a little bit about solar stuff is that uh something that that you're, you're looking into as well like maybe going off grid or something like that in the future yeah man as i'm in this transitional period uh so my landlord dynamic crypto he has to sell his house yeah and uh, you know god bless this guy if it wasn't for him you know, I went from making sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year with my union. You know, I'm in a right to work state, so it's you know that's the sad song is that I chose to go union in a right to work state. Yeah. And and I chose the easy, convenient path. You know, and uh, it's biting me in the butt now because my job has been replaced. My job isn't a job. You know, like I the the things that I thought would qualify me to to keep my job, like learning and and moving forward and progressing your career isn't what a union's about you know so yeah so it's all it's all about filling the estimate you know i got so good at my job that i could take an estimate like an estimate for hours for labor and i can cut that in half i can cut that in half and save the client money like a like a crap load of money yeah along like a lot of money because the my vendor and the casino is actively trying to rip off the client uh, trying to play stupid and overcharge them and bill them on things and place, you know, like, so like I can actually go on site, make the gig go twice as fast and, and, and give them a heads up on what my vendor or client or casino is trying to rip them off on. So it's a, yeah, something, something that it makes sense, like saying it and, and saying it out loud, it makes sense. But you know, you think that you would think that would be one qualification to keep your job, but it's not. So dynamic crypto Hmm. being in the same business and knowing him for like 15 years, he allowed me to move in with him and he allowed me to stay in this house without paying rent for the most part. Oh, wow. And, uh, and man, I had three years of raising my children and it was all because of dynamic crypto. That dude, that dude like didn't have to do it. And his house was foreclosed on even. Uh at one point in time, he had to spend 10,000, he had to sell $10,000 worth of stock just to keep his house out of foreclosure, mostly because I wasn't paying rent because I wasn't getting child support and I didn't, wasn't working, you know? So like Ah. hats off to that dude. So I'm at, I'm at this point now to where like, I had to take my kids and give them back to their mother and be like, listen, this is insane. You're not giving me any help. I got to move out of this house. I don't have a job basically. Yeah. So, so what I'm looking at doing now is acquiring all the tools needed to provide a, as sustainable of a situation for myself, it, you know, between getting these reeducated into a new career, 
getting getting food products that I can process it. Like I, one of the things I hated about raising my kids was spending all this money at a grocery store where I knew the food I was buying for my kids while it was better than what most people buy still was crap. Yeah. So, so like right now I got the juicer, I got the blender, I'm learning how to make, you know, these nut butters. I'm learning how to properly store these juices and foods. Like I'm learning about nutrition. So like I'm right now, I'm trying to, trying to find a more sustainable way to, to live. So yeah. solar, yeah. Panel, solar panels is a big part of that. And yeah. also, also finding a place to live and people, cause I'm a migrant farmer. I'm, uh -huh. It sucks thinking about it, but I'm 34 years old and, and like, I don't have anything to show for the kind of job I have and everything in life. I don't have massive debt like most people, you know, so I'm lucky there. I own my car, you know, so I have a lot of things I can look at and be grateful for, but at 34 years old, I'm a migrant farmer still, you know, I'm, so I'm still yeah. trying to align my, my interests with people. And so right now I got, I got the tools I need and I found a, I found a couple places, but this person's on drugs you know, he wants to get healthy, but he's too busy, like taking Molly thinking that's like a, uh, you know, it's like yeah. street Molly right? that he's not testing, thinking that's like a, you know, a spiritual experience that it's like elevating him and, or there's another, you know, there's just, it's just hard. So what I want to do is I want to get solar panels at the very least just to have standalone or on my car. But even then I'm looking at selling my car, but if I can put solar panels on my car, even enough for like, a 500 or a thousand watt system. Yeah. I can totally see myself like getting my school degree, you know, like going camping somewhere, <laughs> you know, with some solar panels and yeah. working on my school degree, yeah. you know, and yeah. I, it's just, that's kind of where I'm seeing things right now is, is I need enough solar power to either power a fifth wheel with air conditioning and to be able to supply power to my computer. Or, yeah, yeah. or enough solar power even just to run a computer and my cell phone stuff. So, so that way I can just do it. So that's kind of, that's a big deal for me right now is sustainability. I need to, I need to like do it. I need my kids to see it happening. I need my kids to see me growing food. I need my kids to see me with solar power. I need my kids to see, yeah. uh, I just need them to see it. You know, so that way, if I'm not around for whatever reason, they'll just know that's something they can do with their life even, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would, um, uh, Will Prowse is a guy that, um, uh, that you can check out that he has a whole DIY instructional on how to do your own, uh, solar generator. And for about $863 for all the components, um, you can do, I think he, I think he sets out, you can do like a, a thousand watt system, um, for about $863 for the, uh, for his little DIY setup here. And so I think that would be plenty for, uh, I can't remember the, the total amp hours or the total kilowatt hours that you get out of that, but I believe it's, it's good enough for anybody that's, um, you know, wanting to do exactly what you're talking about. And so I just posted that link in the discord chat and you can check out too. And, uh, I think it'd be cool if you, if you had some kind of on the road thing and, and yeah, you were just creating all your, you had your, all your own power and, and you had all that equipment with you and you could just set up at different farmers markets and, and, uh, and do something like that and, and just, you know, travel around for a little bit or something. Yeah. Uh, totally, you know, and that's, totally and that's kind of the thing. It's, it's a tough pill to swallow because, you know, I, I keep talking about like raising my children and my boys and this and this and that. And, uh, you know, like I really need to be stationed somewhere, you know, yeah. like it's, like I, need a house. And, like I actually found some houses. It's just, you know, transitional time right now, but right. Uh, that's kind of the main goal. I would love to be on the road. You know, I would totally love to be on the road, but, uh, you know, just having children. So right now I'm going down that path where like, I can see myself maybe for a year, maybe two years being on the road, letting my kid's mother totally, uh, appreciate, 
the last three years that I spent with the children instead of looking at me like a babysitter. Yeah. And maybe more like a father who can be a good role model for them. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the main thing right now is, is that, you know, it still would just be nice to have incorporate solar in some capacity, you know, just to, cause I don't use power. I don't watch TV. I have a cell phone, which I want to ditch, uh, but I'm going to have a computer that I'm going to be taking my classes online with. So, I mean, looking at my power consumption, I don't really consume much power. So I would love to have a sustainable way to, if I have to go move somewhere onto someone's fifth wheel or be a roommate again, somewhere else, I can really not impede their living situation and be a little more sustainable as well. But, you know, I do, I'm a, I love living in a car actually. I love camping and I love doing all that as well. So it's kind of like a weird conundrum or cognitive dissonance where I got these two kids I love to death and I, and I want to be with them and spend time with them. But I also love like being on the road and I have this opportunity to kind of, you know, spend maybe six months away from them, maybe a year and reorganize my life. And, and in this reorganization process, have solar panels and be sustainable at the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally possible, man. If you, uh, yeah, if you ever have any questions or anything like that, I told you, uh, what I'm trying to do is get a list of people together that I can, uh, buy another pallet of solar panels and, and, uh, definitely like, uh, you know, I built this trailer and my plan is to, uh, you know, be able to sell my house and kind of, uh, kind of travel around and, and maybe even help people get started doing, uh, their own projects and stuff off grid and solar and stuff like that. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, definitely, uh, reach out to me if you are, uh, if you have any questions well, about it or anything. Well, I mean, I got this car, I, you know, it's, it's only a sedan, right? So I don't know what is capable of, you know, actually doing, or, you know, since it's so low to the ground, if it's just going to make it more easy for someone to steal solar panels, I don't know if that's a thing. I haven't heard that, but yeah, uh, it would be cool to like put solar panels on top of my car. Right. Like, yeah. like have enough, have enough solar panel power to maybe let's do 500 Watts to a thousand Watts. Yeah. And yeah. Totally possible. You can do flexible panels. And, uh, I would probably, I would suggest building like a frame, uh, like, out of fiberglass or something so that, uh, they, they don't sit directly onto the, uh, car top, uh, because the heat is going to destroy the cells, uh, pretty quickly. If there's no way for the, uh, airflow or anything to get on, um, to dissipate the heat. Oh, uh, so yeah. And then one, one thing I was thinking, I was like, oh man, uh, is to put it in the windows, but you would, I don't know if that'd be a big enough area to, you know, like say we put on the, it's, it's, a, it's a four door sedan. So if you put it in the back seat windows, you know, I don't know if that would be enough uh, coverage to. You can get uh, flexible solar panels um, that uh, they're like 120 watt and they're, they like unpack. And so that, that could be a possibility uh, is if you wanted to park it somewhere you could deploy it or you could have it set up on the inside of the the window and um you know that yeah there'd be different ways you could do that for sure yeah because i'm so dead set on uh right now i'm looking at my career and just the way my life is right now is just like one big babylonian trap and i'm i'm coming yeah. across some like i'm coming across some like roadblocks just and, and that's how my job's always been too over the years like i've you know my job just i make too much money so uh for example right now which isn't common you know i'm signing into work and they're giving me like really sweet gigs with long hours and and i'm actually like doing what i want to do because i the way my union works i'm on call i can either be like an assistant electric or a head electric or run lighting boards or just do all these different things and they're actually calling me out to do what I'm good at doing that I feel and that I like doing. And uh, so it's like, oh man, now they're, now I'm working. You know, like I have these buckets that I want to build, right? And I, I got work tonight I got to do. I, I just worked the other night. Now I'm working all of a sudden, which is great. I love working, but 
like I, I want to build all these buckets and and plant all my food and get all that going and so it's kind of a trap you know like it's just it's a bit of a trap I I want to just make this leap I've had if I have to do, do the Sylvester Stallone thing or the Dennis Kucinich thing and sleep in my car like that's what I'm I mean if I have to sell my car and sleep in a shelter that to get my holistic nutritionist degree that's what I'm going to do so yeah. like right now I'm trying to like piece all this together so i don't know if like getting solar panels on my car and then because there's a lot of camping areas like go camp at red rock while the weather is good yeah. or, you know or, or go to northern california like i you know right now i'm really trying to figure out like how i can like have a portable solar system you know and so that's kind of my deal right now is like trying to make everything work and <laughs> it's just i don't know it's a headache oh yeah man yeah if uh that's yeah, totally totally doable to to do all that and and I I think I posted a couple links in there. One was uh one was for so you can have uh unlimited internet um on the go is is one of the things that I found recently with uh Will Prouse. He um uh he he has it's a sixty dollar a month plan. And you get a SIM card for it's like AT and T uh, stuff. I, I posted it up in the chat a little bit uh, a little while ago there, but uh, yeah, you get you can get one of those and you you buy a little the little router and you put the SIM card in. It's sixty dollars a month, and that's what this guy uses for his on the go internet. So he's got high he's got the 4g lte works off that cell tower network and uh so he's got a limited uh internet there and then uh and then he's got you know uh little systems for lithium iron phosphate which is what i would uh, suggest I, I would go lithium iron phosphate and do uh and do a diy battery system since uh you, you seem seem like a pretty technical dude but uh yeah, I would do something like a DIY um, lithium iron phosphate with the flexible solar panels for what you're trying to do, and then um, and then just uh, yeah, just yeah, see what you see what you can do and and uh, and get uh, to a point where you can save up enough to 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 buy your own your place and maybe buy some land or something and and uh get a little homestead going put a little tiny house on there or something oh yeah for sure i mean i'm open like i said i'm a migrant farmer so i'm wide open for anything so i'm looking at doing anything from selling my car and sleeping in a shelter and getting my holistic degree certifications to like living on a farm or i mean i know people that own property so right now it's just kind of like trying to align my interest to you know, but I see solar being a big part of that. I see growing food being a big part of that. But you know, so yeah, that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at. I'm wide open to a lot of it. Rock on, man! Rock on! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish you, uh, wish you all the success with it, dude. And and uh, yeah, I think um, you know what you're talking about with creating the products with the uh, the juicing products would be great for. Uh, a great product to, to put on that, uh, the homesteaders co-op if you wanted to take steam for some of these things. And, and, you know, if there's de definitely, if there's like a way that you could like juice and then, and then package it and ship it or whatever, that would be, uh, you know, put like on, put it on dry ice or something to keep it preserved or something like that. I think that would be a really cool product. Well, yeah, well, a big thing would be making coconut butter. I see that being a shelf stable product, like date syrup. I see that being a shelf. It's all about like shelf stable products and being able, I mean, I'm, I'm shipping out of Vegas. So like six months out of the year, I would say maybe even eight, depending on the kind of year we're having. I mean, it's been a really cold, cold year really. But, uh, you know, a lot of times shipping stuff is not ideal, you yeah. know, and, and and really what I'm all about is local economies. And yeah, I do see that being a possibility. What I would really like doing is a rabbit hole I'm going down is uh, Rife. Uh, have you heard of Rife technology or Rife, Rife frequencies? Yeah, man. I actually uh, have a show lined up to go, go into all that. My buddy Rob Yelson, uh, his mother uh, bought a Rife machine um, a long while ago and 
they they actually use it quite often for uh she uses it and they've uh they've had a lot of positive benefits from it so yeah yeah so one thing i'm looking at is the spooky to uh remote uh frequency it, it, it all operates off quantum mechanics which i'm sure that dude knows all about but yeah you you know they have the technology in such a way where as long as you have um yeah the right machine you, you can it depends like there's uh, the cheaper machines you need to actually take the machine to the person and do a bio scan on them uh-huh. but the more the more uh, modern or the more recent machines they developed you can actually uh they prefer hair samples you can use a hair sample uh-huh. or a saliva sample uh to do a bio scan on them and then you can find out what frequency they need and then you put that bio sample into a yeah. To another part of the device and yeah so yeah hopefully they talk about that but that's that's something i can see myself doing more so than not is getting this rife machine yeah. and being like yeah send me your fingernails send me your your hair samples so it gets it gets to be a little voodoo e little witchcraft or whatever but uh yeah there's uh, there's I, actual science there's a lot of science behind it and you know if everybody if anybody wants to look into it there's a good ted talk where they show uh, frequencies being able to obliterate certain cancer cells and, and things like that. So, so everything operates off of, uh, you know, different fundamental frequencies and everything has a natural frequency. And so even our cells are, are crystalline in nature. And so if you hit the right frequency for that cell, you could obliterate it essentially. Um, and, and only, uh, you know, stimulate your natural immune system to, uh, help uh, you get over certain ailments and things. So, so yeah, man, a common, I mean, I know we've been talking for a couple hours or whatever, but a common thing in areas that are like agricultural areas I've noticed. And I first discovered going to Northern California was the very first thing my buddy taught me wasn't anything to do with cannabis. It was about parasites and cancer. And the dude, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people will say this is crazy, but there is actually a lot of science behind it. But he was like, dude, parasites cause cancer. Candida causes cancer. And it's it's messed up. All my friends are dying from cancer. And there's these parasites are causing it. And he was real pissed off about it. Yeah. And, and he was real adamant. And I didn't think much of it, but he opened that rabbit hole up and, and uh yeah long long story short he ended up dying of cancer uh of the liver like liver carcinoma or what it was like a specific thing Uh specifically associated with parasites oh we're commonly known as a cancer caused by parasites in the liver Mm -hmm. and it was just such a wide opening i discovered this because my health went downhill like i was walking into walls Oh wow! Clearly, my head got all inflamed, and there's a lot of I can go into probably why it got caused. There's three main events in my life, and one of them was getting bit by mosquitoes in Northern California, where I grew wheat for him. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And so I still have this bug bite that hasn't disappeared, and that was like four years ago. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. So, but that's a whole. That's just I haven't been to a doctor, and even if I went to a doctor, they can only test for fifty kinds of types of lime and not the other 250 types but long story short i discovered that i'm like oh crap dude and i looked into it and i found all this stuff and i went down this rabbit hole and you know parasite cleanses were working but not that effectively for me and so i did the coffee enema after my buddy died so my buddy died i'm like oh coffee enemas were the answer the whole time we, we kind of laughed at it the last couple of months before he died a friend of ours was like oh dude I discovered the answer to candida and it's coffee enemas. And we, we laughed at him. You know, we were like, this dude's crazy. He wants us to shove coffee up our butts. All right, whatever. (laughs) And so sure enough, like we didn't think too much of it. My buddy never told me he had cancer. It wasn't until like the last month before he died that he was like, I got cancer or he didn't even, even the doctors told us that he wouldn't accept it, you know, cause the whole time he was like, it's parasites, you know, (laughs) and it, Oh, that was, that was just another crazy story, but yeah. So, so I was like, you know what? I 
owe it to my friends and family and people that care about me and just myself, you know, my kids mainly to do these protocols, you know, to, to at least for maintenance purposes. And I did the coffee enema and oh my God, I saw them all. I saw all the parasites. I was just like, it was like I'd been living in third world Africa, you know, I'm like, what the hell, you know, like I don't travel. I don't go to different countries. You know, I do live in Las Vegas. It's a very transient town, but I discovered them all. I'm like, whoa, and I felt dramatically better. And so with the coffee enema protocol, you need to drink like eight glasses of green juice a day. Oh, wow. Yeah, if not, you, if not, like this enzyme that your liver produces from doing the coffee enema will, will go in and destroy all these free radicals and cancer. But without the green juice, you're not actually going to be able to filter it out of your system. So like, oh, wow. So that's the key if you're going to do that protocol. Yeah, you really need the green juices to to help support your lymphatic system or else a lot of the toxins will just get built up. And so the coffee enemas were cool. And so going down, I discovered that the rife frequencies were ultimate, like the coffee enemas in conjunction with the rife frequencies and green juices were like the answer. And wow. I haven't like there like everyone with Lyme that I've discovered online and in person that uses the Rife machines, they are just like living normal lives and healthier than most people I know. Yeah, yeah, man. There's uh, I think uh, you know that people with open minds can uh, you know start looking into these things and and I'm we're I'm definitely going to be doing a show on it. Uh, my buddy is lining up all the all the documents and all the stuff, uh, behind it. And we're going to do a whole show on the science behind it. And, um, and so, so I'll be doing that in the future. So anybody that's like looking into, uh, alternative ways of of healing, uh, you know, I, I believe that all the answers are out there and, uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's up to you to do the research and to realize that, you know, we've all been really hoodwinked and to thinking that, um, you have to stay on this hamster wheel of the the medical system and and you're using all the you know what they what they're what they're doing so um yeah i challenge everybody to go out there and check out the rife machine do some research on it definitely going to have a show on it and uh you know come to your own conclusions and i think there there will be like i think there's a big opportunity in doing these underground health clinics as well you know um and and educating people and i think you're on a great path dynamic green tk um uh, it could really help out a lot of people i'm hoping man i don't want to i mean i even right now as you speak i have a friend dying of candida you know i have a friend in the hospital that he's he's dying of candida right now and it's like i'm watching people and i have another friend whose uncle is whose kidney almost failed because of they don't call it candida but there's a they call it a mystery fungus attacking his kidney and they associate it with valley fever but i mean i can go on like more more, like a lot of people i know are suffering from fungal illnesses that they don't even know about until they go to the er so i mean i just i hope that i can spend more time with my children i hope i can raise them at home and in the process like support my healthy habits by you know, providing products and a service to people that only helps them. So, I mean, yeah, that's, I don't want to see people suffering from unknown illnesses just because they're trying to do the right thing, you know, by following the laws and going to the doctor, you know, they they don't know any better, you know, they don't know any better until they're almost dying. And it's sad. Yeah. Yeah, man. And yeah, having other alternatives out there is definitely, you know, being able to, to educate people, it, 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 it really frustrates me, especially when I see, you know, them give like chemo treatments to children that have cancer and things like that. It, it, it aggravates me to see that, uh, happen because there are, there are other solutions out there that are, you know, work with the natural immune system and, and just seeing that it's like, makes me sick. And so, you know, the more, the more of these, health treatments and, and more that people can look into these things and, and it can be proven to people that these things work and it's not just some hooey, 
that uh, you know will move in a better direction uh, as well. But health is the key. If you're not healthy, uh, the rest of life it can be kind of a bummer. Dude, uh, I mean, I guess I can go on for days about this, and I'm sure there's another show. Or you know, we got to end this, or wrap it up. But yeah, um, dude, in the '50s, a science, for example, I mean, there's been many examples, but in the '50s, a scientist actually looked closely at candida and cancer yeah. and discovered they're like the same exact cellular makeup. They're like, this is the same. So he concluded that cancer in most cases was a direct cause of candida overgrowth. And that it was because of the body's amazing ability to produce survivor cells and the survivor cells was cancer. He was calling it. Well, he was discredited. Like he was a very famous scientist that had a lot of like credence or whatever. He was discredited, lost his license pretty quickly. And then anyone else, anyone else that tried to do the same thing he did and by proving that link got discredited. And the only way that they're even doing scientific studies on it now in 2017 was because in the 90s, a guy running a children's leukemia cancer clinic started giving children antifungals or broad like multi-use antifungals yeah. and and anytime they gave the kids broad use antifungals their cancer would go into remission immediately wow so so after decades of treating children like it became a protocol at children's cancer centers to give them antifungals and more often than not their cancer would go into remission so it, it took decades of doing that to children and seeing results before we started doing scientific studies, which just started two years ago. Wow, that's awesome, man. Yeah. Hey, man, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, we've got the Crimson Clad show coming up. And thank you guys for hanging out. And I really appreciate everybody for tuning in today. And, yeah, we'll see you next week. Peace. Hey, thanks, man, for coming on. I really appreciate it, sir. Really appreciate it, Dynamic Green TK. We'll uh, catch you. Uh, we'll catch you later, man. We got to talk. We got to talk more. Peace, brother.